Hello everybody, it's Will here. Welcome to the first episode of the Blockware Intelligence YouTube channel. Basically going to be going over market trends every week and kind of showing you guys some things that perhaps you'll find useful, uh, basically from an on-chain perspective. And then also we have a short section on uh, Bitcoin related equities down at the bottom of the newsletter. Uh, but I'll be only going over the on-chain trends. Uh, the equities are done by Blake Davis. Hopefully we can get him on um, kind of every once in a while to, to get his thoughts on his section. Uh, but yeah, let's get into it. So some key takeaways from this week are the following. So on-chain supply dynamics are currently at levels that previously priced Bitcoin around 58, 59,000. Um, the macro supply shock metrics that we like to look at um, are all showing really strong confluence um, that, you know, we've got a lot of supply getting locked up and perhaps we're getting some kind of supply shock effect in the market. Exchanges are down 17,104 Bitcoin this week, as well as uh, down 125,501 Bitcoin in the last 30 days. Uh, Long-term holders continue to reach all-time highs in, in terms of uh, you know, how many Bitcoin they hold, and they're sitting tight on those holdings. You know, one of the things we've been watching for was, are they taking exit liquidity? And it does not look like they are, at least thus far, aside from kind of a one-off spike about two weeks ago. Bitcoin continues to consolidate below the, the key you know, technical and psychological level of 50K and the 200A moving average. Uh, also on the edge of a lot of uh, on-chain volume and this little, little cluster that we're in currently. Uh, we're five days now into this volatility squeeze that I kind of pointed out on my Twitter earlier this week. Uh, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, the market is sustaining a, a state of profitability. Hash continues to come back on the network. Um, and with that, revenue per hash has kind of dropped off. Um, and then also we're seeing some selling from miners slightly, nothing that's going to you know, dramatically impact the market. Uh, but they've sold 1,658 coins in the last 10 days. Um, also keep in mind with that increase in hash coming back on the network, we have a hash ribbons buy signal, which has been the most accurate macro buy signal in the history of Bitcoin, uh, which of course is a good sign. So here we're looking at, you know, from a kind of technical perspective, uh, we have this chart here showing uh, the John Wick high time frame indicator. This is basically trying to track these volatility squeezes and breakouts. At the same time, we have uh, the 200 day moving average up on the screen. And so what you'll see is that uh, price is A, consolidating above that 200 day moving average right below uh, 50K. And also that we've just entered this orange shaded area. And this orange shaded area is representative of volatility is, is uh, you know, getting ready for a big move. Another way to look at this would be looking at the historical, uh, you know, Bitcoin volatility index. Either way, um, you know, vol looks, looks ready for a big move here. Bitcoin looks ready for a big move. Um, but, you know, this doesn't tell us the directionality of the move. And so for that, I think on-chain can really offer some clues for us here. So from kind of a uh, structural standpoint, Bitcoin sits in this um, nice little, uh, you know, on-chain uh, volume cluster between, you call it, you know, 45 and, and 50K. In total, we have kind of four main, um, you know, clusters of control, if you will. Uh, we have kind of pre-bull market zone from, from 3K to about uh, 11K. And that's about 28 and a half percent of uh, Bitcoin's money supply has moved there. Uh, then we have the range that we sat in, you know, in, in May, June, July. 15.5% roughly um, of supply moved in that zone. And that's a really strong um, you know, zone of accumulation there that we have below us. Uh, next, we have the current range that we're in, uh, and that's between, you know, call it 45K, 50K. Uh, we have about 9.63% of, of Bitcoin's money supply has moved in this current range. And we're kind of right on the edge of that. Uh, and so it's kind of air between, you know, 50.5K and 54K. Um, but once we get up there, there's another little cluster uh, kind of in that distribution zone from, from earlier this year, uh, and about 7% of, of Bitcoin's money supply has moved there. And that's kind of the, the final little um, zone that we would need to break through. Uh, but I, I suspect if we can get over 50, um, you know, obviously that's, that's proved to be a, a key level here um, over the last two weeks. It's pretty much just air between 50 and 54K. So I wouldn't be surprised to get a, a quick move between that if, if we did break above uh, 50K confidently. So next up as a kind of way to, to gauge the state of profitability of the market, uh, we come to our SOPR metric. Uh, 
SOPR is just a ratio of the, the coins that are uh, spent on any given day and, and looking at the profit that they're holding. And so SOPR is printed pretty much just a textbook reversal pattern. Um, what we've been looking, and we've been tracking this in the newsletter for probably two months now, um, we've been looking for a breakout above one, coming back down, retesting one as support, and then kind of stabilizing above one to get that confirmation. And so we had a textbook breakout above one, came back down on a price correction, retested one as support, and then we've now kind of stabilized above one, which is a really good sign. Um, it's basically confirmation that we're in uh, a, you know, a broader bullish trend. But at the same time, you know, just one little thing to, to throw in there, um, you know, we haven't come back down and, and retest that one threshold um, in almost a month now. So I wouldn't be surprised if we did. Um, but at the same time, when you look back towards late last year, uh, we went several months without a full reset. So, you know, that doesn't mean that it has to come back down and reset. Uh, but if we did get a price correction, I would want to see it bounce off one for sure. So next up, we're, we're looking at our accumulation metrics. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, uh, Bitcoin's, uh, you know, supply dynamics are currently pricing Bitcoin around, you know, 58, 59K. And that's just looking at some of these things and, and uh, looking back at, at levels that, they previously had been at these levels of, of the different metrics. Um, so first of all, we have the liquid supply RSI. This is something I created like two or three months ago. Um, and what you're looking at here is a, a stock RSI, uh, 365 day stock RSI um, run over the liquid supply change, which is looking at um, you know the, the change between a liquid supply 30 days ago and today. Um, and so you can kind of track these broader supply shocks in the market, if you will. Uh, and so what you see is when, when the oscillator comes from a full reset below that the, the range and then comes back above, you get this uh, shock effect in the market. And so we had that um, leading into the 2017 bull market, um, you know, coming out of the, the bottom of the 2018 bear into the, the little mini uh, bull market in 2019. Um, also, you know, the, the bull market that started last year, and then uh, we've just gotten another supply shock uh, kind of coming out of the bottom of that, of that uh, two, three month long range. So, you know, it seems to me that, that you know, the, the full effects of this are just getting started. And when you look at the rate of which um, this supply shock in comparison to, you know, the previous three on the screen, um, what you'll see is that the RSI is pretty much just vertical. Um, there's no chopping around, um, you know, there's no hesitation at all. It's just been straight accumulation um, since we since we were in the bottom of that range. So to me, that that's showing that this supply shock perhaps has more momentum than any of the previous that, that we've seen. Next up, we have our supply shock ratios. Um, and so you'll see three different uh, you know, metrics on the screen. You'll see the blue line, uh, red and purple. We'll get into what those are. So. Um, the blue is the liquid supply shock ratio, and this is uh, something I created with Willie a while back. It tracks the movement of coins from speculators to strong hands. Um, we have the red, which is the, the highly liquid ratio that tracks the movement of coins from highly liquid entities to liquid entities. And then the purple line is the exchange supply shock ratio, which is essentially measuring um, you know, how many coins are available to be bought on exchanges relative to overall circulating supply. And so on Tuesday, I put this tweet out that, you know, we kind of had this bullish divergence here where price was kind of grinding sideways bearish. Um, and we had, you know, some some uh, nice uh, up moves in, in all three of these. To me, you know, this is this bull div um, is kind of uh, interesting that that it kind of aligns with, with the volatility squeeze that we touched on earlier. And perhaps this kind of gives us some hints as to the directionality of that squeeze. Um, you know, we, we've seen these bullish divergences before with the, the supply shock metrics. You know, it, it tends to, to be the case where it's like, you know, the, the, longer, the longer that it takes for, for the divergence to resolve, it tends to be a larger uh, move once it finally does get priced in. Um, so I'm kind of suspecting that that kind of dynamic plays out here where, you know, we, we've kind of just been going sideways here. But once, once we start to move up, I suspect it'll be a pretty rapid ascent. So from a macro perspective, looking at uh, the liquid supply shock ratio, we see something really interesting. So when you kind of track this out um, over, over all Bitcoin's history, we've kind of um, traded in this, in this you know, descending uh, channel, if you will, in the ratio. Um, and then 
you know, kind of in, in mid to late last year, we, we broke above this channel. And to me, what this is kind of illustrating is just that, that the macro hodling behavior has changed. Um, and as, uh, you know, unlike, dare, dare I say, this time is different, um, unlike any previous cycle where you have uh, market participants basically holding their coins stronger than ever. Uh, and we really started to see this behavior change after COVID, which is really interesting. Uh, perhaps this, you know, illustrates some some capital that's coming in and, and using Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. Um, and so next up, we have our exchange flows. And so you'll see four main charts here. Uh, in the top left, we have the balance on exchanges, uh, the stacked version of that, I'm basically showing each individual exchange. On the top right, um, you'll see uh, the exchange net position change. This is showing the 30-day change between what, what are exchange balances today, what are exchange balances 30 days ago. Uh, in the bottom left, you'll see balance on exchanges on Coinbase. In the bottom right, you'll see balance exchanges on Binance. So this week, exchanges are down over 17,000 coins. Um, and over the last month, they're down over 124,000 coins. So starting to see really strong accumulation flows again in, in exchange flows. This is something that, you know, was, it was a big narrative towards the beginning of the bull run. You know, everyone was talking about how coins were getting around out of exchanges. Well, we had about 145,000 coins that moved onto exchanges in mid-May in a matter of like two or three weeks. And now we've seen all those coins get reaccumulated uh, and starting to see continuation down in, in terms of exchange balances. So this is, you know, obviously a really good sign. And to kind of look at the broader trend, I like to look at the exchange net position change because this is tracking the broader month, you know, 30 day change. So, um, you know, you can get some some noise on, on kind of intraday movements, perhaps day to day movements. But if, if you start to see a, a trend show up on the exchange net position change, you know, you have a broader macro trend there. Um, also, kind of a little interesting dynamic, you're seeing coins move off Coinbase while coins are moving on to Binance. So perhaps this illustrates that you have buyers in the West and sellers in the East. And then also it could just be a proxy for the amount of demand for, for Binance, which has all these speculative products on almost anything that you can imagine. Uh, next up, we have the stable, uh, the stable coin exchange reserve ratio. Uh, this is something that I created like two or three weeks ago. It's basically looking at uh, the amount of exchange, I mean, the amount of uh, stable coins in circulation um, and how many of those stable coins are on exchanges as kind of a proxy for, um, you know, A, are, are people moving stables on, on exchanges to, to kind of have uh, dry powder or B, you know, are people, uh, you know, covering collateral. So what we've seen is a big increase in, in this, uh, you know, ratio showing that coins are moving onto exchanges. So you have this interesting dynamic of, uh, you know, stables moving onto exchanges coins moving off exchanges. Uh, and then next, as, as we kind of mentioned about the long-term holders, uh, you know, the, the number of coins that they hold continues to reach all-time highs. And so what we have here are, are two different ways to kind of look at, um, you know, their, their impact on the broader market structure. Uh, the red line is, uh, you know, the percentage of, of adjusted supply that long-term holders possess. And so adjusted supply is filtering out UTXOs that haven't moved in at least seven years. And, and these are coins that uh, Glassnode considers uh, you know, lost. And then the green line is just um, looking at overall circulating supply. Um, you know, what's the percentage of supply that long-term holders uh, possess? And so for circulating, um, long-term holders now have over 68% of supply. And in terms of adjusted, uh, long-term holders now have over 85% of supply. And so this is this is pretty incredible in terms of um, the rate that these long-term holders have reaccumulated coins. Um, you'll see that here in this chart, and you kind of see the bracket here, the two brackets here at the bottom when you compare, um, you know, the late 2017 into the into the bear market um, compared to now. Um, the rate of change, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of comments when I post these charts. People say, um, "Oh, well, the same thing happened heading into the bear market in 2017. How is this bullish?" When you look at the rate of change, it's not even close, right? Um, and then at the same time, you have a higher base that that uh, you know this this metric was able to to grow off of. Um, and so yeah, so like that that to me that differentiates it. Um, and then kind of from a, a macro standpoint, when you compare uh, long term holders to short term, we get the long term holder supply shock ratio. We're just kind of entering this zone where we get this macro supply shock. Um, and so once again, this is showing the same thing as, as previous uh, metrics that, you know, over the next month or so, we're going to start to see the full effects of this. 
On a similar note, uh, as something we touched on in, in the key takeaways, what we've been watching lately is like, are long-term holders taking this exit liquidity or are they just sitting tight? Because in late uh, 2017, heading into the, into the dead cat bounce, you saw long-term holders basically jump ship um, and, and say, okay, I'm out, right? Like, you know, Bitcoin rebounded to almost uh, 17,000 and, and it looked like, you know, at the time, long-term holders, um, you know, just decided, okay, look, you know, I, I want to secure my profits, I'm out. And so, uh, you know, spin outputs over six months spiked to almost 45% at the time. Um, currently, we're seeing nothing like that. Uh, we, we had like a one-off spike to about 18.75%, but since then, it's actually been declining. And so you see similar things with uh, metrics like uh, ASOL or dormancy. You're seeing a, a you know, general uptrend, which isn't, uh, you know, to, you know, that's not unexpected in, in a, you know, uh, upward, uh, you know, market trend, because you're going to see people take profits on the way up, but we're not seeing anything, you know, that's, that's flashing a red alarm that that's saying, okay, long-term holders are just absolutely, you know, jumping ship here. Um, and so this is, this has been the main metric that I've been looking at to kind of uh, identify is, is this perhaps a dead cat bounce? And so far it does not resemble so at all. And then finally we have our minor metrics. Um, and so you'll see three different uh, metrics here. You have um, the purplish line, I guess you could you could call it, or, or blue. Um, that's the hash rate. Uh, the green line is is revenue per hash, and then uh, the orange line is is minor balances. So what you see is that hash rate is, has continued to come back on the network slowly but surely. Uh, still far from uh, you know where it was at you know peak levels, but um, it is slowly coming back on the network. Uh, and in green, what you'll see is kind of this inverse correlation where as hash comes back on the network, you then have difficulty adjust, and then it, it leaves the miners on the network uh, less profitable per hash as, as more competition for that uh, you know, block reward comes on the network. Uh, and then what you'll see in the, in the orange is that over the last, you know, call it week or two weeks, you started to see miners trim their holdings a little bit. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of attribute this to, to two things. A, just higher prices, right? Um, you know, some of these miners accumulated really heavily um, in that in, in that range that we were in, you know, 30 to 30, 30 to 40 K. Um, and they took advantage of, you know, how profitable they were after, after uh, you know, Chinese miners came off the network. Uh, but also I think part of it, um, although probably not as, as, as big of a piece here, is the fact that their, you know, their profitability has been kind of dropping off over the last few weeks. Uh, but nonetheless, this is still way higher than it was, you know, call it, you know, uh, three, four months ago. So that's all for this week, guys. Um, and then also we here down at the bottom, we have a section on uh, Bitcoin related equities written by uh, my buddy Blake Davis. So definitely check that out as well. I just don't want to speak for him and, and maybe mess up any of the points that, that he wanted to make. But, um, you know, great work from him as well down at the bottom of the newsletter. And yeah. So uh, looking forward to touching base again next week, guys. Um, we'll have the first episode of the podcast out on Saturday, hopefully, with, with CEO Mason Joppa. Um, and we've got some exciting guests coming up as well. Um, a couple on-chain guys, a couple TA guys. Um, and yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, I'll be able to learn something. You guys will be able to learn something. And uh, we'll just continue to get, uh, you know, different guests with different strengths and, and, and learn something from kind of the, you know, the smartest people in the space. So, yeah, looking forward to touching base, guys, and I uh, hope you have a great weekend. Cheers.